So. All right. I love that you brought your gear with you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm not leaving my camera in the parking lot of No, definitely not. Mall, no, so. for sure. But there she al- be. always prepared. Always prepared to go out, shoot. Kind of like a Boy Scout. Always be prepared. Kyle Shepard. At Kyle Shepard. And also, I love that uh, he just dropped this bomb on me about how he used to be in the professional radio business right after I told him how to use his microphone. <laughs> so that's a good way for, for me to... Good job, Kyle. Good way to start off the podcast by telling we're prof- a this professional. Is directional <laughs> Say what? <laughs> I, I don't even know how to plug this microphone in. <laughs> uh, so thank you for being here. You're welcome. Um, it's good to be here. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Um, also, I'm going to be self-conscious for this entire thing because you're going to be seeing my not professional setup compared to what you're used to in your uh, past career. Good. I'm used to hanging out in old basements, so no worries. Excellent. Um, so Kyle Shepard has a background in night photography um, and amongst many other things. Uh, first off, you come from a pretty artistic family, right? Isn't your sister's a pretty artistic person, right? Yeah, so my sister is a year and a half older than me. She's definitely a multi-talented artist. She's, she does things like canvas paintings, murals, uh, sculptures. My mother is a professional sculptor and her uh, deceased brother was uh, actually uh, quite a nationally famous uh, painter by the name of Daryl Jones. Uh, He actually, I've seen his prints in uh, places like the Power 97 studio, uh, lawyer's offices, dentist offices, so on my mother's side, there's always been a strong artistic base. That's cool. Uh, her parents are into it too, but you know, certain people never pursued their artistic uh, talents because you know their parents were saying, "Hey, you can't make any money doing this," mm-hmm. which probably happened to a couple photographers along the way too, <laughs> right? Probably. That's pretty cool. I had no idea actually about the rest of your family. I just knew from your Instagram posts that your sister was yeah an artist. So. Yeah, that's again me. I guess apparently not doing my homework, but okay, we'll just we'll move on. Uh, you've been featured many times. One thing I want to talk about: uh, you've been in McLean's Magazine, April thirteenth, twenty fifteen; CTV News, April fourteenth, two thousand and fifteen; uh, Global News, May twenty fifteen; the Winnipeg Free Press, August twenty fifteen; and the Loop dot CA, April fifteenth, two thousand and fifteen. Uh, that was all about night photography and specifically spinning steel wool. So what was that like? I mean, that's quite an accomplishment to be featured, not just once. I mean, most people will take just one article, but you've got multiple. I mean, you got five, just five that I could find in a split second. Yeah, that was a, a period of time where things were kind of blowing up for me as far as the the steel wool brand, uh, my, uh, the, the brand that I came out, f- uh, with steel wool photography. So it was at a time when, uh, a lot of people were just kind of figuring about, uh, figuring out about light painting and, and night photography. And then there's this niche with steel wool spinning, which has been done for probably a decade or more in places like Europe. Um, so and classic so, Europe beats us to the punch. Exactly. France, you know, England, some of these places, artists have already been fine tuning this style. Uh, whereas here, um, it was just kind of blowing up with the Instagram, uh, years. Mm-hmm. So I took it to a neck, uh, the next level here. Whereas I'm perfecting the style I'm landmarking. So I'm doing these images with with the sparks flying and doing these uh, images at very famous sites in Winnipeg and around Manitoba. So everybody's starting to turn heads and they've never seen things like this. So it, it was it was a good time to start start kind of exposing this style and, yeah. and blowing it up in a new way. Yeah, and you, I know in one of the articles, or actually multiple articles, you said you were doing it in a way to, like, explore your own city, to discover Winnipeg, and also show it in a new light, because yeah. we both know, let's be honest, Winnipeg gets dumped on way more than it deserves. Yeah, and I'm a 
you know, I'm at fault for dumping on Winnipeg oh, at me too. times. Yeah, me too. Um, some people... We're allowed. We're born here, but... Exactly. I mean, <laughs> and, you know, some people don't see it in the way where, you know, there might be an angle or a place they've never seen at a certain time of day. And uh, being able to shoot things in a new way and, and sh- show these images to the Winnipeg public and the Manitoba public uh, was pretty special, you know, making places that are somewhat grungy actually look pretty appealing just with a new light source from mm-hmm. the steel wool, right? So really cool way, really special way to to do something new and interesting to people. So with me looking through this list of these different media outlets, to me, McLean's Magazine stands out. I mean, lots of people can get featured in a local newspaper for whatever it is. But I mean, mm-hmm. McLean's Magazine, if anybody's listening to this who doesn't reside in Canada... McLean's is a national magazine, national news magazine that's been around forever. And it's, it, I mean, it's quite, it's quite a, a respected journal, I would say. For sure. So, so what was that like when they contacted you? That was a big deal because when they contacted me, uh, it was the first time that I had expressed negativity on my Instagram page where in this instance, I actually called out a journalist on the McLean's writing team who had recently penned an uh, article regarding Winnipeg uh, being the most racist city in Canada. And uh, it, it, it was an expression of the power of social media, whereas I actually tag somebody in a post on Instagram with their handle, um, and they actually saw the post, they read it, and then their team actually gave me an email and later a phone call. Hmm. So it just goes to show you how how social media, like, it, it can give you that power where you're putting yourself on a platform that every, there's, there's millions of people that are connected to, right? So in, in a given second, you can post something and somebody a world away can see it. Um, so yeah, that was cool. And again, timing, like I said, they just had done that article. So I think they were looking to do some janitor work and they saw something <laughs> special I like about that. that. Yeah. So they were cleaning it up with this story in my opinion, but again, timing played a part because I think they wanted to do a story about Winnipeg that was, you know, quote unquote in a better light, so mm-hmm. to speak. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. It's still, still to me to this day, I can't believe that I am in an article that's in a magazine that you might be reading at the dentist's office, you know? I remember seeing it in the aisle at Safeway. And at the time, so this came out in April 2015. At the time, I knew who you were. I followed you on Instagram, but I hadn't met you in person yet. And I actually had been, if my memory serves me correctly, I had been meaning to... Uh, ask if you wanted to do a collaboration, but I just, I guess I hadn't done it yet, but then saw this magazine. I was like, I gotta, I gotta go shoot with this guy. I gotta see what this guy's all about because of the night photography. Um, so then I guess I like DM'd you or whatever. And then we went out and shot it at an old, an old bridge here out on, on the West part of the city, which was still one of my favorite shots that, uh, I've ever seen of steel wool. It was was pretty dope. If you know what I'm talking about, the one that was inside the bridge. Yeah. That was actually the first, First shoot I ever used magnesium. That's right. Too. Yeah, that's right. I was I was thinking about that, and that I was, was thinking something cool. about that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we did the test shot on the grass with the magnesium. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Totally. For, actually, yeah, I forgot about that. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so back to the because you mentioned um, McLean's found you because of social media. So like I said, Kyle Shapper or at Kyle Shappert, K Y L E S C H A P P E R T. Um. Do you, how do you feel about amount of posts and amount of followers? Do you care about numbers? Is that a big deal? Uh, can I say what the, your numbers are currently? You can, yes. Okay. So your posts are at 4,835. So you're a machine. I don't know how you do that, but we'll get to that later. Um, and then your followers, you're at 9,801. So how do you feel about numbers? Because I know there's been a lot of people talking either both publicly because in Canada the last uh, couple of weeks, Instagram got rid of likes, showing likes. Some people like when I, on the last, our first podcast, I was talking to Dennis, uh, 
about this where on his app, you can't even see the amount of followers people have, which I didn't even know was a thing because my app is still the older one. I don't have that rollout. So I can still see people's followers. How do you feel about numbers? I think numbers are significant in certain ways. Um, At this point, not so much anymore. I think like, let's say circa 2015, when I was first getting involved in Instagram, uh, it was a big deal to get uh, more followers and to get featured by Instagram and to get more likes and to get exposed more. Uh, the more likes you got, uh, the more people saw your photo, the more companies wanted you as an influencer for their products. Influencer. The whole influencer uh, thing. So it was just really this matter of popularity where numbers were very significant. Um, I know people who used to do tricks to get more followers and to, to get more hits on their post. And it did, it, it, it in some ways resulted in more residual work for them Mm -hmm. or just more popularity. So I think that the numbers were more significant a few years ago, still now have some significance, um, in some people's minds, like let's say, um, a media outlet would be more likely in some cases to interview somebody with more followers. uh, Even though they maybe don't deserve it. Like someone might have way less followers, but has really high quality work. Exactly. Like for instance, um, if you were involved in more platforms like YouTube, if you already had a lot of people watching your videos on YouTube, if you started an Instagram page, you would automatically have a big audience. So, you know, other photographers might have a hundred or 200 followers and they might be complete experts in all sorts of photography. Whereas somebody starting brand new, just because they were on YouTube and they have all these followers already might have, they might have 5,000 people following their account right away because they're already popular but that doesn't say that they're a good photographer or that their shots have good composition or the lighting is proper. You know, they might be two months in, but like I said, they have 5,000 followers on Instagram just because they were a YouTube star or something like that, right? Yeah. That might not be the best uh, example, but it, it does have some relevance. And, um, like, I know one thing that's kind of always irritated me about Instagram with features and feature pages. Yes. Um, I find that a lot of feature pages only feature people with mass followings. That's true. And I don't think that's fair. Um, Um, Yeah. Yeah. Like a lot of the times on some of these massive pages, I'm not going to name the pages, but I'll look at, I'll click on the username of who the feature was and there'll be uh, 400,000 followers, 80,000 followers, 1.2 million followers it's very rare where the guy's got like sub 4,000 followers or a thousand followers. Yeah. Like you you see that once in a blue moon, even though some of these guys that have a thousand followers or five, like some accounts have four or 500 followers and they've got amazing work, but they ain't getting featured. No, no. So, So like, do you think that's like a popularity contest? In some cases? Yes. You know, that like, for example, like, uh, there's pages like, visuals of life or some of these large scale accounts that have uh like couple hundred thousand followers where you know they'll say okay you know this is a feature from a 5,000 follower plus artist or a 10,000 so they kind of categorize you and the photos that they feature uh as far as your follower base Mm -hmm. so that's a direct judgment of your work based on your followers. So that, that's, that's just a, a normal thing in, in this world, I think. Right. Um, like I said, in the last response, there's, there's a lot of people who have a lot of followers that are not good photographers. They're just really popular and they might just post a, a shot of a sandwich on a table with their cell phone and they get like, you know, it, it blows up and then somebody like, you know, takes a time stopping photo of a street scene in Paris or something. And it gets only a few, you know, that's the way it goes with social media. It's not always how good you are. You know, it's how, how popular you are. Mm -hmm. It's just like in radio, 
back in the day, if you had more spins, that was how you got bigger. It was okay, you know, you got 100 spins, 200 spins, your song's playing. That's, you know... I gotcha. That's a little off off the uh, no, it makes sense off the theme. But for <laughs> me, at this point, what's in, what's most important besides the numbers is is knowing who my followers followers are, the people who see all my posts, not just half of them. Yeah. Because those are the people who I'm posting with in mind that they're going to see the photo. So like, if I have ninety eight hundred followers and seven. Or uh, and seven thousand of them are Winnipeggers and Manitobans, then I'm going to be doing most of my posting geared towards them because that's who I care about, right? I don't really care about like another couple hundred or a couple thousand people that you know they're just they don't matter, right? Yeah, and so also too if you're um. If you're focused towards more towards a local group, that's kind of good because you, like you really explore, you really explore the province. Like you're, like I would almost say, other than being a, a, a long expo night photography wizard, like you're also a really big uh, nature photographer and into uh, landscape photography. Uh, like you're, I think, what's the hashtag on on your bio? It's like ex, uh, Adventure Manitoba. Adventure Manitoba. Yeah. Like, did you come up with that, or is that uh, a hashtag that's known amongst people who do outdoors photography in Manitoba? I was the first person to use the hashtag Adventure Manitoba. Since then, there's been a handful of photographers who have used the hashtag. Majority of the posts are within the theme. Uh, some of them aren't, so that's just the way it goes with, with hashtags, right? But... Um, yeah, it's 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 integrated into my lifestyle. I always have my camera with me, and I'm a big wilderness enthusiast. I do a lot of hiking and a lot of canoeing. And then with the whole pyro thing, that's more like my photographic alchemy type deal. But uh, my main, like my everyday life is pretty much that wilderness enthusiast. Uh, so a lot of landscapes. Um, and I would say that's changed over the couple of years. Like, would that be fair yes. to say four yes. or five years ago, it was mostly night stuff and light painting. It was mostly night stuff. It was mostly urban. Um, and then at one point I just kind of, I, I changed landscapes, so to speak. I started, I started shooting a lot more in places that nobody else was shooting and, to to find these places majority of the time you're going out of winnipeg you're going to places that are lengthier to travel to and harder to get to and that's where i choose uh to shoot the majority of my photos these days because i well for one there's less people around so there's less people taking the photos and it's just i'm i'm looking for my next best photo in places where i haven't seen people shoot many photos. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the path I'm on is seeking out new shot locations outside of the urban landscape. So where are some of your favorite locations? Um, one of my favorite locations I'll be traveling to coming up June 7th to 10th. Uh, Quisichuan Falls is the name, and that's Manitoba's largest waterfall. It's closest to the community of Waboden. It's about 695 kilometers north of Winnipeg. So uh, when you just get off the highway, there's Pisu Falls Provincial Park, uh, which is, uh, well, Pisu Falls is Manitoba's second largest waterfall. So um, that's by far my favorite spot in Manitoba. I actually proposed to my... Uh, to my fiance Jennifer, there recently... And just waterfalls in general, any anywhere where there's rapids or m fast moving water, I find are my favorite places to shoot, and just hang out in general. So I find like I'm always, you know, following tributaries to wherever they lead me. You know, lakes, rivers, mm -hmm. the whole thing. What about uh, Tulabi Falls? Because you post a about a lot about there too, don't you? Yeah, Tulabi Falls is definitely in my top five. It's I think number four right now. Um, I've just spent a lot of time there. Um, it was one of the first places that I shot 
you know, a lot of photos at. I just wanted to, I, I would live there if I could, man. Hmm. That was one of my favorite spots. But since then, I've actually gone um, upriver from there and found some even even like I would say nicer spots like Snowshoe Falls. There's just been there Manitoba is full of these gems. What part of the province is Tula be in Snowshoe just for our um listeners? we're looking at mm, hmm, that's hard to say, like northeast. Uh so like north of Bassett. Like stuff like in there. South like, of Bassett still. Okay. But uh, in Nopaming Provincial Park. Okay. So south of Atakaki, but still in Nopaming. But anywhere along the Bird River uh, is beautiful. But Tula Bee Falls, really special spot. Go there every May long with my dad for fishing. So that's kind of how I got introduced to the spot. Mm -hmm. It was in, like, I think 2014. Shout out to your dad. Yeah. What's his name? Is it? Uh, Scott. Scott, okay. Yeah, that, which is my middle name. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, like, that's... I owe him to introducing me to that location. And I've been traveling there uh, at least like five to 10 times a year since then just to enjoy that location, whether it's taking photos, camping or all everything in between. Mm -hmm. Oh, and just while I remember, uh, should have said before, shout out to your sister. Um, do you just want to give her a quick plug for what her Instagram is since we were talking about her earlier? Yeah. Shout out to Rachel Shap art. That's a R T instead of E R T. But yeah, she, that's uh, a pretty sick handle. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> she's been good. doing some cool things like, uh, if you check out her page, she's making some really <laughs> interesting chocolate. She just really she puts all sorts of things like she'll pick wildflowers and extract uh, oils from them and put them in chocolate. She's you know doing all sorts of custom art stuff, which is really cool. I can't even teach her to use an iPod, but here she is on Instagram. So look at us go. Uh, one other place that. Is a pretty popular is uh, Pinawa Provincial Park with the Pinawa Dam, the abandoned Pinawa Dam, which I'm actually kind of embarrassed to say. I've actually never been there. Oh, uh, the look okay. on your face right now. <laughs> Holy. I know I've never been there. I, I'm an embarrassment to people who both live here and to people who are <laughs> photographers. Um, but that place looks pretty sick. I know I got to get up there um, at some point. Uh, another place that I wanted to bring up that you along with some other, or actually not just some, but a lot of people go to is Churchill. Mm -hmm. uh, that place you were telling me before is like a Holy Grail. So you've been up there once? I've been up there once, yes. And how, how exactly did you get up there, if you want to tell us that story? Because um, it's a good it one. It was a couple of years ago where there, I think Travel Manitoba still does contesting, but they don't have coveted prizes of this nature so it was a con it was a photo contest too many people follow them now i guess they, they too don't many spend the people money. maybe it's a budget issue yeah, budget. i don't know uh but anyway so a couple years back travel manitoba is having a photo contest where every every week or month there was a different theme uh so when i was entering i was obviously entering every theme but the sky theme is where I, I guess, where I excelled. So I, I love sunset and sunrise photos. And, you know, I'm doing a lot of night photography. So lighting, I take lighting very seriously. So I actually ended up capturing my first lightning strike at Garbage Hill. I had some really clutch photos uh, entered into this contest. So... Um, I ended up being a finalist and then I ended up w being one of the, I think six or seven winners and I won a free entire trip to Churchill where we were, you know, staying in the, in, in some nice places. We took the train all the way up there and all the way back. So it was a really cool experience that way. Um, but yeah, right in the in the heart of of the in the Instagram photographer inside, just kind of growing. Churchill was this paradise for all these different themes that I was chasing. Although I didn't get to shoot too many night photos because the polar bears were quite active when we were there, so it was a little more. What time of year was it? Uh, it actually wasn't a busy time for polar bears. It was more like June or July. Okay. So it actually wasn't like the season, 
but still, um, the abandonment, the, the landscape there, you just feel like you're on the edge of the world, right on the shores of the Hudson's Bay. Um, so back to the abandonment, you had every, you had everything you ever wanted right in one small community. You had an abandoned shipwreck, an abandoned plane crash, an abandoned military barracks, a rocket test location, and the list goes on. It was really incredible. And plus, the the natural world out there was really something else, too. Uh, just the entire scene there for a photographer was really special. So basically, even if you were to quit photography at this moment, that trip alone was worth getting into photography. I think so, yes. Um Creating a meaningful connection with your environment, I think it is important in any respect. And being able to take advantage of photography uh, really, really set that in motion for me. Whereas before, uh, my my connection to to Winnipeg and to Manitoba was not nearly as close as it is now. Um, you know, a lot of people are f- trying to find ways and this is a perfect way, like mental health, everything. This is, this is a good way to do it. Hmm. All right. Um, you also started a feature page, like we were talking about hashtags before, but, uh, that wasn't the only hashtag you started because you started a feature page a while back, Peg City Spinners. Oh yeah. Can you tell us what's the latest with Peg City Spinners? Peg City Spinners has been lying dormant for quite some time now. And actually, um, my steel wool spinning rig has been lying dormant for a little while now. Going to have to change that. Going to have to change that for sure. Um, Kevin's ears just perked up. I know. He's probably listening in right now. Um, So what was the question again? Oh, sorry. Yeah. um, I was just talking about how you started a feature page, Big City Spinners. Big City Spinners. Um, That... When I started that, it was kind of at the peak of my steel wool spinning career, let's say. And the idea with Peg City Spinners was it was kind of like a global thing where it, you know, I wanted to have that theme where it was featuring artists from all over the world. So I wanted to have this page where everybody, you know, from like, you know, countries, it didn't matter. We got China, United States, all these, all these European countries that have really good steel wool spinners. I wanted to put them all on the same platform and have that landmarking theme to it. And just taking advantage of Instagram for, for, uh, to its full advantage where, you know, you can put everybody from all these different countries together. So that was the goal um, it was, I, I think it was a success for, for the time that it was running. There was always folks who were spinning steel wool and creating cool images in all these, uh, different countries all over the place. Um, so there was never a shortage of artists to feature. And the special thing about running a page like that is, you know, for myself, I'm spinning steel wool. I'm, I'm doing all these images around town here. And it, you know, it might get old a little bit, um, but there's always artists out there that are finding this this new thing, this new uh, style for the first time. Mm-hmm. There, every day, yep. every week, there's always new people who are figuring things out. So it's it's giving these people a spot in the in the limelight that I wanted to do too, because I was, you know, I was that guy trying to get featured all the time. And then running a page, you start to feel how it feels to have people who are just trying to get featured on your page. And it's just a whole different thing. Is it hard to run a page? I think it's hard to run a page in the sense where you're basically volunteering. You're putting your time into this page where if you want to do it well... You might even try, be trying to generate uh, items to give away from different companies. Um, but yeah, you do have to volunteer a lot of time. It's not like somebody's paying you. Um, so it's pretty much a community-based thing where 
you know, it might be a timed approach where you're posting at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. So there's some responsibilities there. So, you know, sometimes it might be a little cumbersome for folks who are already a little busy in their lives because, like I said, it's not like it's a paid thing. It might get you a little bit more exposure, but the benefits are not always there for mm. just kind of growing your personal business, let's say, or something like that. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, it's definitely a commitment. I mean, if you got to always try and find photos under the hashtag and, 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 and try and curate it, try and pick out what's good, uh, try and not always feature the same person, uh, try and get some diversity in there. Mm-hmm. Did you find that it's hard to get a following? Like, did, like how, what would you do? Would you just kind of throw that hashtag out there on your own page? Like, how did you get it so people in Chicago or California, where those two places have a lot of spinners, mm-hmm. would find that hashtag? Other than, I mean, I guess a lot of them were probably already following you at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things is just networking. So, like, sending direct messages to other uh, people on Instagram who are managing pages, getting advice. Um, and then there's grouping hashtags. So when you, you know, when you make a post, you can use up to, you know, 30 hashtags. I think it is. So when you combine, like, let's say hashtags that folks in these centers like New York and Chicago are using with, with newer hashtags, then they might see your post via a hashtag that they're accustomed to, uh, looking at or like following and then they might see a new hashtag on a photo you posted so there's that kind of link and then there's just um just kind of hitting the streets and hitting the the so like the social media outlets as hard as you can so you know more hashtags in 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 the height of my instagram career i would say I was posting six times a day, so I was like blasting people. Yeah, uh, it, like I, you're, that you're an animal. I like. probably <laughs> would have more followers because of uh, all things considered. You know, you're only supposed to post once a day. They would say based on ad- analytics and people getting Annoyed. turned off. But they also said you should only have like you should have, you should curate your page with a specific a specific theme. Um, so I kind of ignored that, you know, I found that hard. Cause I mean, if you love different aspects of photography, it's too difficult to stick to just, to just one. Like I know myself, I like architecture photography. I like landscape photography once in a while. I like doing a, a portrait. So for, to just stick to one, I mean, it's kind of limiting and it's not fun. And it's supposed to be about having fun. It is. And I mean, for me, when I'm, when I'm thinking about the people who are looking at my photos, I mean, sure, it's great if you post one photo from an entire experience that you had, but in my mind, I would kind of get a little bit more detailed. So I would post a photo on Instagram of an experience I had, uh, knowing that that photo was following a theme that potentially could get more likes based on, you know, just following this popularity suit but I would also take a bunch more photos and I would want to post them too and the difference between myself and a lot of other folks who were focusing on analytics was that I I would post six photos a day I would post a macro shot I would post uh, like all these different photos from an experience I had not just one photo of me standing in a landscape uh, enjoying the area or you know just your kind of cookie cutter Instagram image, but just not caring about the analytics and getting a little bit more detailed to give your followers more of a sense of what's at what, what you're actually experiencing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about was since you're like, I consider you one of the granddaddies of the Winnipeg scene of the long exposure night photography. Um, how did you start? Why did you start um, like I know when I mentioned the, the global news article before about Steel Wolf, anybody wants to, to check that out, there's actually a couple of videos that uh, our buddy Gage Fletcher uh, made. Uh, shout out to Gage, who's now living in Toronto, who is like a, a wicked uh, videographer, used to work for Glo- uh, 
not Google, Global. Also a really good photographer, so uh, check him out. Uh, I will pull up his his Instagram just to, if you give me a moment. But like, how did you get into that, the steel wool and the night stuff? Well, um, right off the hop, I was working 11 to 7. So I had that going for me where my schedule really was fitting for becoming a night photographer. Um, when I had this work schedule, it was at a time when I was just learning how to use my camera. Um, so I wasn't really big into digital photography and I didn't really take photography seriously. But then, uh, when a good friend of mine, uh, by the name of Joel Boyley decided to take me under his wing, uh, he actually convinced me that I would not only enjoy night photography and learning how to shoot in manual and just manipulate uh, light a little bit more in a detailed fashion, but, you know, he actually got me on Instagram and he said, you'd probably really like this. Um, So I got on Instagram and learned to take night photos at the exact same time. So you've only been on Instagram since like 2014? Uh, it was like 2014 or 15. It was, okay. I was a couple years late. I'm a... Well, you made up for it. Yeah. <laughs> that's one of the things about me you'll find is I'm pretty stubborn. So like folks will tell me like, you'll, you'll like this and it'll take me a long time to come around. But uh, in that case, we're looking at circa May of 2015. Uh, the first night photo I took was actually that, that uh, shot where, you know, you could see the the Real Esplanade kind of framing out the downtown skyline and you're on the opposite side of the river to the forks along Tache. Oh, in St. Boniface, I, yeah. I was right there. I took that shot. It, it was so crisp and I was so impressed with myself. I can recall the evening being so impressed with myself that I could take an image that that was actually that sharp, that looked that good. Um, so that spurred this whole thing for me where I wanted to take night photos as much as I could. I was finding myself leaving the house three to four nights a week, uh, whether I was alone or collaborating with fellow photographers or, uh, you know, urban explorers, anybody who is involved in that scene. I was out there. I spent countless hours in parks in back alleys, in old abandoned factories, you know, from the bottoms of sewers to the tops of skyscrapers. I was all over the map trying to take all these night photos and then integrating the whole uh, pyrotechnic style into it with the steel wool and the occasional fireworks. Um, And we're talking about, for people who are listening, we're not talking about when we say night, staying out till 12.30, 1 in the morning, we're talking about 4 or 5 in the morning, yeah. like watching the sunrise Mo- and then getting those bangers. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing, right, is uh, staying up all night doing these steel wool shots. Sometimes we would be shooting at these locations where we would we would say, well, we might as well just watch the sunrise and next thing you know, there's our next best photo. So uh, it was kind of a two-way street for for photography in that respect. It's not an old man's game. No, definitely. (laughs) uh, You have to be passionate. You got to want the shot, especially if you're staying up all night. Am I right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's been a couple times where you get one or two hours of sleep and then you go right into work or don't get any sleep at all. But it's worth it, especially if it's something you love. Um, You were self-taught. Am I correct in that? So Pretty much self-taught. I did have... A couple of mentors, like I mentioned, Joel, uh, he worked at Don's Photo, so he was accustomed to using, like, every brand of camera. So he he taught me how to press the buttons, so right. to speak. And my other friend, Brody, um, who I've traveled extensively with through Europe and South America, and he's one of my closest friends. I actually work with him. Um, he taught me things like perspective and composition and, you know, photos where one little thing is in focus and everything else is out of focus, just 
kind of putting a style on things, you know? Okay. Right on. So, yeah, and I just want to say uh, Gage Fletcher, his Instagram is at gage.fletcher, G-A-G-E dot F-L-E-T-C-H-E-R. And uh, Joel, who we both know, but he's a, a really good friend of yours. I've only met him a couple times, but he's, he's a great guy. Uh, at Joel Boily. Bo- I said that right? Yeah, okay, awesome. Uh, J-O-E-L-B-O-I-L-Y. And Joel and his wife, Cheryl, actually run uh, one of the, I think, premier Winnipeg wedding pages, or ph- Winnipeg photography wedding pages, uh, black and gold photography. So at black and gold photography. Um, I mean, they really have a killer style. Uh, they're fantastic. Um, some of the gear you use, you, I know you switched to full frame a while back. No. Right? Oh, no, it's not full frame. No full frame. Oh. I've never shot full frame. I'm still, uh, still waiting to upgrade. So what was, the, <laughs> what was the reason then you bought that new body? Like just a um, superior camera? And what body is it from the old body? I started out with a Nikon D3100, and I upgraded to a Nikon D500. Okay. Um, the reason why I upgraded... Um, there was a couple of reasons. The Nikon D500 was basically the best DX format camera that I saw Nikon having at the time. And I was pretty much, I'm, I'm pretty much a Nikon shooter yeah. other than like GoPro and DGI for, for my other stuff. I'm surprised we're friends because I'm a Canon shooter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, I won't mention that anyway. Although my dad's always Nikon, so <laughs> maybe that's why. <laughs> Uh, no comment. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so Nikon D500, the reason why I picked that camera is because of the autofocus, uh, is really on point. Uh, it has the same autofocus as the full frame, uh, what is it? D800 or whatever it was like, you know, this camera was three grand, uh, when it was brand new and the step up was a couple thousand dollars more. So yeah, those are heavy hitters. Exactly. So if you're willing to stay in the DX format, the Nikon D 500 was pretty good. It's also good in, uh, with ISO. So for low light and for long exposure, the photos are of the utmost sharpness for a DX format. And I also shoot a lot of wildlife Ah, uh, touche. Yeah, true. Yeah, so for for that autofocus and ten frames a second as well. So we're talking super fast and more of zoom, like more the crop zoom factor with with that factor in mind. So there actually is a lot of birders out there that do use a Nikon D five hundred just for birding alone. Yeah. Um. So I just was kind of like this. You know, I was diversifying a little bit from night photography when I was purchasing the camera, so I saw that model fit. And I have only uh, very few select lenses. Uh, my go-to lens right now is a Sigma 18-35 to 1.8. Is that the art? That is the art lens. Oh, that's man. a $1,300 lens. That's a serious, serious lens. So that, that's my go-to. Uh, I waited a while to get it because of the money. Uh, I also have a Nikon 70 to 300, um, just your basic 5.6. So uh, that's what I shoot for the long game. And then I have an ultra wide Sigma 10 to 20, uh, but I haven't used that in a while because I'm like, it, it does have a little vignetting. So I don't know. I just have been more into the art lens. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, that's a great lens. I mean, I don't have it, but. I've always kind of wanted it. I know like that those art lenses, the art series is fantastic. Uh, you also have DJI. You also have a drone, uh, one of the Phantoms. Uh, how is that? Like, how do you like it? Uh, so I rock a DJI Phantom 4. Uh, it was, I believe, the newest when I purchased it a couple years ago. I love it. Uh, one of the things I love most about having a drone is being able to go to all of these places, like Tulabee Falls, for instance, some of my most favorite locations, shoot the drone up and see see some of my favorite places from a different perspective. Um, and I also use it for scouting out new locations off the beaten path. Uh, being able to put eyes in the sky is similar to 
like let's say being able to put a GoPro underwater, you're really cutting all of the obstacles. You're you're smashing them. You're not even cutting them in half. You're smashing them. So you can shoot underwater, in the sky, on the land. There's no, there's really no boundaries anymore. And the drone is one of the biggest, biggest, uh, you know, one of the biggest, I think, uh, steps forward, technologically speaking, for for photographers and videographers. Mm-hmm. It's a big deal. Do you have any filters for it, like uh, ND filters for the drone? Or do you just shoot it straight? I just shoot it straight. Um, usually do most of my correcting in post, but I actually, um, yeah, I just... Uh, the ND well, is probably more for video, I'm thinking. Yeah, I don't really... Uh, I mean, most of the time I'm shooting, I'm not really... I don't really see the requirement. I mean, maybe a... Excuse me. Maybe a polarizer would be the most beneficial, but I uh, still haven't invested. I know. I got to, you know, I don't have any ND filters or polarizers for my main lenses. <laughs> I've been needing to get it for like two years, but because of the expense, I've just been putting it off. So, yeah, the good ones are like a couple hundred bucks, right? So. Yeah. And then I also kind of don't know how to commit. Do I want to get it for my 18 to 35 or for my 24 to 70? So, exactly. I, yeah. Or do I get step up rings? Like, I just, I can't yeah. decide. So I'm just, I got to make a decision. Sometimes filters can be like, you don't need them, right? I've shot with a polarizer where I'm like, oh, that didn't make much of a difference. You could just kind of do, I mean, if you're, if you're looking to get the shot without editing, then maybe, but yeah, I mean, obviously there's light conditions that, that need, that, you know, require you to have whatever. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about? all the new drone laws coming into effect in this country starting tomorrow, which is in about an hour and 45 minutes. Um, I'm kind of indifferent. I took a little bit of schooling on becoming certified, uh, whether it was just a basic license or a complex license. We don't need to elaborate at this time because it's, there's a lot of jargon, let's just put it that way. But um, in some ways, I feel it's a good thing. Uh, things are getting a little more understandable as far as the rules are concerned. It seems like things are a little more user-friendly with with uh, Transport Canada. Um, it does kind of curb, curb you in certain respects uh, with all the legalities, um, but I think it is all for the good. Um, That being said, I don't know if I want to become completely legit at this point uh, because you really can't slip up at all. Uh, Fines, fines are pretty big. I mean, even when you're, uh, even when you're certified and you make a mistake, the fines are still like huge, like in the multi thousand dollar range. Yeah, $20,000, $30,000. So it's kind of, it's it's hard for me to say. Uh, most of the time I use a drone, it's in the middle of nowhere. So in that respect, I don't really care about the drone laws because I'll be flying on, on the down low most of the time anyway in the middle of the wilderness. Uh, for folks who are trying to do little corporate uh, project work, kind of stuff like that, I think that it's going to suck for them because it's going to... Uh, You're going to have to charge more because there's more time involved. There's more bureaucratic hoops to jump through. So it's just going to end up having the customer paying more for drone work is all. Yeah. I know I really wanted a drone, but now that these laws are so ridiculous, crazy, strict, whatever word you want to use, to me it's not even worth spending the $1,000 on it. Like I might as well just either pay off some debt or add more debt and buy a lens, like not put it towards a drone. Or you can be like me <laughs> and break all the rules and see how far you can No, that, that, well, That's probably what I would do if I had one. So I'm not going to tell you. Uh, well, I'll tell you that I have received one serious call from Transport Canada and I've gone through the process of having somebody call you out for breaking the rules um, and I'm happy to say that I dodged 
any and all fines that could have been generated from that situation, which was about a year and two months ago. Uh, but yes, I've bro, I've, I've, I've definitely bent the rules. And at this point, I'm going to say that I'd rather be on the DL. I'd rather not update my my software so that I'm on this grid where I could just be judged by everybody. Like I think that if you don't make a mistake, you sh- you know, it's just that whole thing where these laws are affecting people who would never never screw up in any case, but you know, now we're having to jump through all these hoops like I mentioned. Yeah. See, okay, here's the thing. Um that I get annoyed with Transport Canada. So, I mean, if you're listening to this and you're in the States, I, I, I don't know, I can't remember, I haven't kept up with the drone laws in the States. All I know is they're a lot more relaxed than what's going to happen here um, 90 minutes from now. Is basically, at least around Winnipeg, the drone laws are, even if you're someplace like downtown, which is something like five to seven clicks or kilometers from the airport, you can't fly a drone. Basically, the entire city of Winnipeg is with is restricted airspace space, yeah. which is stupid. Do you hear that, Transport Canada? It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Okay, d- like downtown Winnipeg, no planes ever fly there ever, unless you're a jumbo jet flying from Anchorage to Chicago and you're at thirty six thousand feet. There's no need for that to be a no fly zone. If you're in the Polo Park area and you're close to the airport, I totally get it. Totally makes sense. But if you're going to be out in Transcona, and you're wanting to shoot the uh, the via rail passenger train come into the city, and which is like a half hour drive minimum from the airport, and you're still in a restricted zone. Like, are you kidding me? That's complete crap. It is, and um, I've kind of figured out a couple of things along the way. Whereas, like, the government does not have access to your flight records through DGI. So I think that there is something like there is some advantage, uh, excuse me, there is some advantages to kind of flying under the radar right now. I'm not too educated there, but um I don't know. It's it's hard for me to say, man, with how these laws are coming into place like you said. If you're writing off the entire city due to uh, not a nine kilometer radius being completely written off for flying drones. I don't know. Like, it's just really, I mean, you're really like taking something special away. I mean, I get it. There's people out there that are flying drones that are making poor decisions. It's happening every day. I mean, it happens on the road too. It happens on the water. It happens everywhere. It's, it's, it is how it is. See, here's, yeah. The thing that bothers me is crack down on things that are actually putting public safety at risk. Now, I know right now there's people listening that are, oh, well, people who fly drones, you could crash a plane and it can hit a plane and you can kill 200 people. I, I get that. And that's like, it's a serious, it's a serious deal. It's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Like if you're being an idiot and you're flying it where you can't, you put serious lives into jeopardy. But, you know, a, a huge restricted airspace where planes never go ever there's no need for that why don't you go after the uh the people that are like so here in manitoba we just had so or last like year so we have some serious crackdown on using your cell phone while driving i'm not going to get into the specifics but it's probably one of the strictest provinces in the country where if you get your cell phone it's something like a thousand dollar fine and you lose your license on the spot for a, a few days on your first conviction without even going to court um But yet someone who has a stupid dog in their lap while driving with the window down is perfectly legal and would never get into trouble. Meanwhile, that is 10 times more distracting and unsafe than some guy who happens to just touch his phone in the cup holder because he's following Google Maps to somewhere. Like, that's BS. So this Transport Canada is the same crap as that. Why don't you go after someone who's got their dog in the lap and eating a cheeseburger and putting on makeup instead of something, someone who's flying a drone downtown five kilometers away from the nearest flight path. Yeah, my, my perspective is that, um, I mean, obviously there's an issue with uh, people and their space. You know, some people don't want you to fly at the beach when their kids are running around and, 
you know, there's that whole personal space issue where... Yeah, I get it. Privacy. That makes privacy sense. Privacy yeah. is a thing. But my thing is, like, show me the numbers of the people who have used a drone incorrectly versus people who have just done, like, very basic flights. Maybe they wanted to just see something or have a little fun, and, and that's it. And, you know, I bet you the numbers are, like, you know, 99.9% to 1% where you got this small group of people that suck at flying drones and they make poor decisions and they have influenced uh, an entire list of laws that in some cases are, in some cases, excuse me, are, uh, I think, overdoing it. And I don't know, I think it's just really just kind of putting things out of perspective. Well, and the other thing about the drones, so downtown Winnipeg, most people who fly drones, of course, I don't have one. I've never flown one, but I know people such as yourself and other people who have them. I've been around them when they're in the air. A drone on average, say if you're downtown, it's going to be five or six floors high, like into the air. It, so maybe on average at the most 100 feet, maybe 200 feet. The Richardson building, which is a, a skyscraper downtown, is just over 300 feet. It's 32 floors. Now, most of the time, drone's not going to be that high. But even if it is, planes aren't flying at 300 feet downtown. Or if you're going to take a picture like uh, some people have done downtown where it's above the skyscraper, that's maybe 500 feet. So then maybe, yeah, now you're getting close to that territory. But for the most part, people aren't flying at 500, 800 feet all the time. No. Like, they're just not. Like you're flying it at 50 feet, 100 feet, a few stories above the ground to get a perspective shot. Yeah, a lot of people are just... Um, so if they're buildings that are taller, that drone isn't going to affect a plane where a plane will never exist. No. I mean, there is there is some disruptive... Um, I think something with, like, this the, the signals or GPS that the drone uses, I think might mess around a little bit with with whatever technology the aviation industry is using. I know I've seen somebody fly a drone downtown uh, over the pool on the high on a high up floor of the Delta Hotel and they just lost tra- they lost signal and it fell right into the pool. <laughs> um, so I've seen things go down like that but I don't know. I do have a question. Like, I do have. I do question wh- what you know. What negative effects the drone would have on like any sort of technology other people are using. But I don't think. Honestly, don't think that it's that mu- much of an impact where they have to be. I bet it's zero because they either I use ra- zero. They either use radio signals or they use Wi-Fi. So if they use Wi-Fi, it's no different than anybody's phone or iPad, which is also in a plane used during flight. So that was busted years ago about you can't use electronic devices because it affects the cockpit cockpit instruments. That's also garbage because everybody knew, and then this came out, that the pilots use iPads during takeoff and everything. (laughs) Uh, And now they allow you to use all your electronic devices anyway. Yeah. So that's not true. So really, I can't see it affecting anything, the the signals. Yeah, I think the big... I think the big idea is just to make it harder. I mean, Canada makes it harder for us to do things like travel, like, you know, like where things are different here. Um, but I, I don't know. It's like I, I'm letting out a big sigh. You know, that's how I feel. Like, I feel like I You're don't defeated. Wanna, I am defeated. I don't feel like I want to go legit based on some of this stuff that we've been discussing um so i don't know like it's i i might even be flying a drone tomorrow over saint vitell park (laughs) we'll see that's okay this won't come out until after that's done tomorrow is arbor day (laughs) (laughs) see you there oh all right so now that we're all cooled off from that got a Oh, yeah. One other thing. Before we get to the closing questions, I wanna, wanted to bring one other thing up. Um, you produced your own calendar a while back. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I um, had the opportunity to work with Friesen's Printing, which is actually 
Canada's largest printer of hardcover books. Mm-hmm. They also have massive clients like Gillette. Um, they have all these cool companies that they do flow form packaging that they have a patent for. Like this company has a research and development department and, and they're based out of Altona. So which is population less than 10 K or maybe like 13,000. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. It's just in the middle of nowhere, but it's a really cool, this really cool company to collaborate with. Um, so I had the opportunity to do all the photos in the entire corporate calendar a couple of years ago for Friesen's printing. So the, the, the cover, the back, all of, all of the pages all had my photos on there. Um, so that was probably my second, if not my first, um, like my largest project, I would have to say as, as a professional photographer, um, I was given countless uh, copies of this calendar to sell. I was selling them in places like Chapters. And this um, wasn't just a regular calendar. Like, it was like a ringed, like this was, it, it was had a, rings in it. Like, it was a thick special it was a calendar. It very uh, high quality. There was uh, some holographics on on the inside of the cover. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was a pretty sophisticated project. Um, it probably resulted in the largest uh, amount of residual income that I've ever made as a photographer. And one of the main themes and one of the reasons why they sought me out and chose me as their corporate artist for that year's calendar was the fact that I was practicing uh, light painting and the steel wool photography style. Uh, that was a new thing to them and they wanted to do something different because they were usually focused on photographers that were doing more landscapes and wildlife. So it was, uh, it was part of that time where, where I was being interviewed and the McLean's thing came out and this was all part of that. And I made the most money from this project. So I'm very thankful f- uh, for for the collaboration with Friesens and for the fact that I was chosen out of a group of photographers who practiced this style to actually be published. Yeah, that's pretty cool because it was all it was uh, all steel wool spinning shots, right? It was uh, stuff. majority steel wool uh, images and night images. And they actually had me spin uh they had me do a steel wool spin in front of a sculpture uh that is on the Friesen's printing grounds uh and this is an interesting story because uh I'll go on a bit of a tangent here do it when I got the feature in McLean's magazine in the next publication McLean's put out after it there was an article that was titled Arts Collateral Damage. And what this article uh, was was explaining was, I guess I did a steel wool spin uh, close proximity to a sculpture near the Assiniboine Park footbridge. Mm. Um, Agassiz Ice is the name. The, uh, the name of the artist escapes me at this time, but my sister actually had him as a, as a professor at the U of M. So anyway, the artist who did this sculpture, uh, her, uh, his niece wrote into McLean saying that basically uh, the artist is very upset that I was uh, doing steel wool spinning around it and that I was uh, basically damaging his work and that it was, you know, 10 years of work for 10 minutes of fun, I think, something to that extent. And Gordon Reeve. Gordon Reeve is, the is artist. his name. It was commissioned 2008. Yes. So he was quite upset. Uh, And I believe he was upset by the fact that a photo I took near his sculpture was being published in McLean's. Um, The funny part is one year later, Friesen's Printing actually commissioned me to do a spin near another one of his sculptures for the front page of the calendar. So they actually paid me. And you know what? 
I actually lit a, a, a bunch of prairie grass on fire at the base of the sculpture. And the management team... I hope he's not listening right now. Even if he is, <laughs> I hope he is. Because guess what? The management team from Friesen's Printing was watching as I was spinning the steel wool and creating this fire. And as I'm stomping out the flames on the prairie grass, I am receiving a round of applause from the management team at Friesen's. They loved it. There you go. <laughs> Take I that, love Gordon. It. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, it's that's a good story. Thank it's, you for sharing that. It's pretty interesting how how I don't know, it was so twisty turny, you know. Here I am being ostracized and the next thing you know I'm being praised. Like yeah. that's how it felt being a steel wool artist. Everybody's like, "Somebody think about the kids." You know, there's always somebody who's upset at <laughs> you. About- now you know what it's like to be Kylie Jenner. Everybody loves you. <laughs> And everybody hates you. <laughs> it just depends on the day of the week, I guess, or how <laughs> yeah. much sleep you got that night, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Closing questions. Um, I meant to do this last week with Dennis, but in the uh, all the excitement of it being the first time of the podcast, I forgot. So sorry, Dennis, but we'll do it next time when you come back for season two, if there's a season two. Uh, so this will be a couple of questions that I'm going to fire off at you. Random. Uh, I tried to just come up with, this is some questions I thought of just a little over time randomly that I thought might be just kind of fun, quick questions. Strangest, most exotic place you've lost or damaged camera gear? Uh, most exotic place I've damaged camera gear was... Uh... How's this? Uh, so I'm hiking the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu, which <laughs> is one of the wonders of the world. Yep. I have my Nikon D3100 and my Sony HD camcorder. This is about maybe seven or eight years ago. And we're hiking. It's a 42-kilometer hike to Machu Picchu. I am l- literally learning how to take photos with a digital camera in one of the most like in such a special place we were hiking through a forest in the clouds at one point there's all these exotic plants i'm taking some of the best photos of my life at this point and out of nowhere the moisture gets into my camera and i can't use it so here i am i'm almost at one of the eight wonders of the world i'm hiking on this trail and my camera conks out. Oh. And I'm, th- uh, I actually, to this day, I have photos blown up on my wall that I took before my camera conked out. Um, so you couldn't get it to work? I couldn't get it to work for the rest of the hike. Uh, so I got to Machu Picchu. I got zero photos. I got zero photos at Machu Picchu. I maybe got a cell phone pic. I don't even think I got a cell phone pic. I got camera footage on my Sony HD cam uh, but I had to rely on my uh, fellow uh, traveler and photographer friend who actually specialized in film at the time, Brody to take all the photos. So I was the quote unquote videographer when we hit Machu Picchu still a little rattled that I couldn't take any photos but I had to have you know that feeling of saving grace from Brody taking all these fantastic film photos when we were there. He also had a, a Nikon D90, I think, which is a bit of an older version, uh, older model. But so, yeah, that that sucked. That I'll never forget that. Putting my camera in a bowl of rice when we got back to the hostel in Cusco. But at that point, what's the point? You might as well just have pitched it off a cliff. <laughs> it was, you I mean, know. I probably would have. I probably would have been so upset. I just would have launched that thing. Off of Machu Picchu and said, not only that, my life's over. But I had a film camera with three lenses on me, and the film camera got jammed on on the same hike. So, (sighs) not like I'm talking like an extra 20 pounds in my bag, and we're hiking like, like uh, it was heavy. I was carrying a bunch of equipment that I couldn't even use. Two cameras at one of the 
modern or ancient wonders of the world and can't take yeah. any photos. Uh, they were calling me the white porter with how heavy my <laughs> bag was from all this camera equipment that seemingly wouldn't even work for me. So, Okay, well, I'm never asking this question ever <laughs> again because no one will ever beat that. <laughs> like that, boy, that's, I'm definitely glad I asked that question. Uh, number two, pie or cake? Cake. Red velvet cake. Oh. Uh, my mom has made myself a homemade red velvet cake every year for my birthday, probably since I was like able to shove it down my throat. Hmm. So would that be your last meal if you're convicted to death in Louisiana? I don't know. Either that or some really good fried chicken. Mm. <laughs> Coke or Pepsi? Uh, right now, Coke. Growing up, it was Pepsi, but right now it's Coke. Mario Kart or Diddy Kong? Mario Kart. Ooh. Movies or TV? Movies. If you could only have access to one media format for the rest of your life, will it be music, movies, or TV? Music. Yeah, I'd be the same. Yeah. Well, Kyle <laughs> Shepard, thanks for coming in today. Thanks for having me. And thank you to all of you for listening. Um, if you enjoyed this list, uh, listening to this podcast, please give us a thumbs up and a follow and a subscribe and a rate and all that fun stuff. Um, unless you're like me and you just can't be bothered. Uh, if that's how you are, then that's okay too. Uh, you'll find us on Instagram at, at the third rule. That's with the number three. And on all podcast platforms, uh, we're now up there. And also on the YouTube machine, too. So if you prefer to listen to podcasts that don't have any video, um, we'll be on there as well. And lastly, a shout-out to our sponsor, Binford Tools, which you can find at any local Sears store or in the local catalog. Just tell them that Kyle sent you. Okay, that's it. Thanks again to Kyle over there and this Kyle over here. Goodbye. <laughs>